ओके ओके गुड इवनिंग ओके दिस इज आइकोमोस श्रीलंका वी आर गोइंग टू हैव आवर मंथ पब्लिक लेक्चर टुडे आवर गेस्ट स्पीकर इज फ्रॉम साउथ अफ्रीका ही इज प्रोफेसर हाइंस रूदर टुडे ही इज गोइंग टू स्पीक ऑन स्टेट ऑफ आर्ट स्पेशल डॉक्यूमेंटेशन ऑफ हेरिटेज साइट्स taking examples of polonaru and medirgiriya so i welcome uh, professor hain srudar and uh, the the audience and uh, first of all i would like to invite uh, our secretary sagar architect sagar jaisingh to give a kind of introduction about uh, professor hain srudar uh, before starting the lecture and then uh, then uh, the lecture will go on around one and up, one hour and then we we will have a q and a session conducted by uh, senior vice president professor nanda deva and uh, and after that he will propose the vote of thank and conclude the session so uh, i i think now it is time to invite uh, sagar to give the introduction thank you sagar thank you architect jati sehrat so let me introduce our guest speaker for today's lecture professor emeritus ains ruther professor ains ruther graduated with the degree of diploma engineer at the university of bonn and obtained his phd in photogrammetry at the university of cape town in south africa in 1982 he is a fellow of the university of cape town a fellow of the south african academy of engineers and former vice president of the african association for remote sensing of environment from 1990 until his retirement he was the head of the geomatics department at the university of cape town professor rudder has worked on numerous photogrammetric and surveying projects in europe asia middle east and especially in africa he has extensive experience in digital photogrammetry those range photogrammetry precise engineering surveying and deformation analysis he has supervised numerous msc and phd research projects and published more than 130 papers in scientific journals and international conferences professor rudder's current research interest lies in digital photogrammetric and laser scanning or 3d modeling of architectural monuments and the documentation of cultural heritage sites in 2004 he founded a research group named african cultural heritage sites and landscape database at the university of cape town he is still the principal investigator of this group which is now known as the zamani project he is actively involved in the field work of the zamani project which has under his supervision documented more than 60 heritage sites with close to 300 individual monuments among these are the rock churches of Lalibela in Ethiopia the fortress and castle in Ghana the rocky one monuments of Petra in Jordan the valley of queens in Luxor and temples and pagodas in Baga Myanmar and at Polonnaruwa and Madiri in Sri Lanka So now I pass the proceedings to Professor Ruther 
to start his presentation on spatial documentation of Thank you very much for the Hello. kind introduction. Thank, can you hear me? Yes, yes, brother, you can uh, continue. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's, um, it's a pleasure and an honor to address this meeting. Um, I've had a great interest in Sri Lanka. I was there as a, in my early academic years. For one year, I, I worked at the University of Moratua. And I was very glad to be able to be back. And I will talk about the state of the art of spatial documentation of heritage sites. And the format of the presentation is the following. I will briefly discuss the design of digital spatial heritage data, or database rather. I will talk about data acquisition technologies, the type of data we are producing, I will show you some applications, including the House of Wonders in Zanzibar, which is specially current in the moment, as there was an, a collapse recently. Uh, I will show you some examples of other sites, indicate some problem areas, and if you've got the time, I will also show you some examples of fly-through videos, examples of a panorama tour, and 3D model navigation. Uh, I will not go into the detail of, of this uh, design of a database because we don't have time for this, but just to show you the complexity of this. We've got 2D data, we've got 3D data and image data. Uh, this is specifically our database, but the format is something which I think is generally adopted for databases like this. And I hope that maybe we can include some more Sri Lankan data into our database or set up a separate small one for Sri Lanka. Um, as I said, no time to discuss the detail. Uh, one of the bottlenecks in our system, or the, the weaknesses, I should say, uh, is the non-spatial data. I'm not an archaeologist, I'm not a historian, I'm a technical person. Um, so I don't have much knowledge of the history, the historical background of these sites. I read, of course, I, I love heritage, but I'm not an expert. And that's why I'm very reluctant to put information of this nature on our database because I don't want to make mistakes. So whatever contribution you could make to the data which we've got, it would be most welcome. What is very important is metadata. And I think anybody who works in this area uh, would have probably made that experience as I did as well. The hard way we didn't, we have over 250, nearly 300 monuments. And at the beginning, we didn't look into metadata sufficiently. Uh, we had to pay the price. It takes much more time to produce metadata later. And I'm mentioning this. If you ever do anything like this, make sure you have metadata. The principal objectives uh, for producing heritage databases for me was I wanted to document, document sites for future generations. I want to create increased awareness of heritage sites around the world, but especially in Africa. Uh, I don't see we have the need in Sri Lanka to that extent, but in Africa, there's certainly a need to create that awareness. Uh, in Africa, is the contribution of creation of identity a very important issue? partly due to colonialism and so this was a bit suppressed. So heritage can contribute to, awareness of heritage can contribute to that. Um, and we also provide information for students and scholars. Um, we support responsible tourism with our data. Um, we uh, do capacity building and heritage, um, showing people how to do data acquisition. And we provide data for conservation and restoration and for rehabilitation. I have pointed out these two uh, lines in red, because this is where we get support. All the other areas are too esoteric, and there's not enough evidence that they actually can produce something. So uh, we work in non-for-profit, we need funding, so I get funding for lines seven and eight, not for any of the other ones. But we'll see that later. Special data types, um, we have, we produce sections through these are all examples from Sri Lanka, I think, yeah. Um, sections through architectural structures. People use ground plans, elevations. We have videos, panorama tours, and 3D models. And I will show you examples of these. All these we combine in geographic information systems, or as I would like to call them, spatial information systems. Uh, sorry, as side, my apologies, side information systems. Um, so all the data are linked through an information system of this nature, 
uh, and can then be visited accordingly. Uh, this is an example of a 3D model. And uh, when I talk about resolution, that's the distance. These models are comprised of millions of points, sometimes billions of points. And the points on the surface of the model are two to three centimeters apart. That's the resolution which we typically use. Um, this is the Watadaga and Polnarua. By the way, please bear with me if I don't pronounce the Sri Lankan names correctly. Um, this is another model, not in Sri Lanka, but this is in Africa, in Gonda. Again, um, the resolution is two to three centimeters. The accuracy is also in the centimeter order. So you can, on these models, you can actually measure the centimeter accuracy. Uh, you can measure wall thickness, window size, door size, whatever is needed. And you can go into the model, you can walk through it. And uh, I think these models are some of the better ones which are generated. And we also um, create elevations. This is a site in, sorry, in uh, Myanmar, in Bagan. And it's untextured. When I talk of texture, I'm referring to the, the color of the surface. This, as you can see, this is merely a grayscale model. Um, but we can texture these as well with photographs. So untextured in our technology and our language means without color and textured is with color. Again, this model, you can see grid lines on there. Um, this in indicates that the model is accurate. You can measure to centimeter accuracy on them. Um, as an example from your country, uh, these are five meter grid lines again. So you can again measure um, the, this is a texture model. The surface is white, that's why it looks grayscale, but it is in fact textured. Um, an ex uh, example of a section through a building, and this is a church in Ladibela. These are stone hoon churches in Ethiopia. It's a wonderful site. There are about 11 um, stone hoon churches there. We documented the whole site, and this is a section through it. Um, in the background here, what you see here, this is a curtain. That's why it looks so irregular in shape. Um, we were not allowed to go into the Holy of Holies, so we could only uh, document everything outside the, the curtain area. A ground plan or top view. Uh, this again is in Africa. Uh, it's Fasil's castle in Gonda. So all this can be generated from the 3D models which we create. We create a 3D model. Um, we then create the examples which I showed you. By, we can section through a model in any orientation and any at anywhere in the model. Um, what you see here is a, a ground plan of a larger area, not a single building, but a whole settlement. This is in Kenya. And uh, we create sections through these models. We show, as I said before, as I'm repeating myself a bit, so the sections are then indicated on this ground plan. Uh, and we do them in both directions. So we look to the east and the west or left and right. And in this case, I think it's 10 sections uh, which we created, but we can, as architects or conservators require it, we can create sections in any orientation. This is an author photo. You're probably familiar with the term. It's also used, the term is also changed to photo map um, on the other, nominations for it. But I, I think you are, as architects are familiar with this. Uh, this is a not a photo anymore, it's actually a map. You can measure on it. If photos are distorted, as you know, because of perspective use, this is a map. And the resolution is five to 10 centimeters, depending on uh, the terrain here. Um, is again, it's in Gonda in, in Africa. So if five centimeters on the ground, five by five centimeters is one pixel in the image. So it's a very high resolution um, map. Again, very precise, can be measured with high accuracy. Um, this is another example of our work, which we also tried to do. We've done it in Polonarua as well. We created geographic information systems. This is Timbuktu. Um, as a matter of, uh, in, in Mali, as a matter of interest, this was used in a court case of the International Criminal Court. They used our data to uh, for evidence of uh, areas which were affected by terrorism. Um, now about data acquisition. How do we get this information? 
we use laser scanners. This is our principal tool. They're very expensive. Uh, this one belongs to university, but we have access to it. Um, we use terrestrial cameras, high resolution cameras. Um, we use drones, very important tool. We've only uh, started using drones about four years ago, but we're using it extensively now, in addition to the other data. Um, here we've got, uh, we'd also use a drone in handheld form. In other words, we, we carry the drone around the area, through the building, sometimes we even fly the drone inside the buildings, but we carry it around. So in addition to normal cameras, we use drone photography. We are creating, we are collecting an immense amount of data, as you will see from example, which I gave you later. There are small compact laser scanners, which we use extensively in Sri Lanka, especially, I think, on both sides. Yes. These are about 20 centimeters high, and they can be placed into nooks and niches and in areas where you cannot set up a large laser scanner. And we use GPS to locate the building very accurately on the um, Earth's surface. And also we use it as checking. If we have a large area which we scan with a laser scanner, we put all these scans together and then we check with GPS if there's no scale distortion or anything. Altogether, these instruments are used to create the final model. The stages of this are there's a point cloud to start off with, all these millions of points which you collect. Um, they are then turned into a mesh model where the points are connected automatically. It's, it's a slow process. It takes a long time, even on a very fast computer, because we are dealing with very large numbers of points. Um, then we render the model, which means in, in a display, the surfaces are um, filled. The, the triangles between points are filled. And finally, we create a textured or cut up model, which means we are draping photographs over the, the mesh. So we've got point cloud, mesh model, render model, and texture model. Um, to give you an idea of the volume of data, this is in uh, Meridigria. Meridigria. Um, what you're seeing there, the white points are positions where photos were taken either with a drone or from the ground. The yellow ones, which you might just okay, recognize here, those are laser scan positions. So we have, in this case, we had 500 scan and 9,500 images, which generated the point cloud. Again, this is a, not a trivial process to put it together. You need very sophisticated software, very expensive software for it. Um, by the way, I didn't mention the laser scanner cost uh, nearly $80,000. Uh, so the expensive instruments and the software is also expensive. So it's not something which one can easily do. Um, then in the next process, we clean our data. This is a model which we created, but on there, as you, as you see, there are items which should not be there. So in a rather time-consuming process, we clean them out. You've seen here, there they are X still there, and there they're gone. Um, this is also not quick because we need to um, do a bit of cloning in the background to, we try to be also as authentic as possible. I always tell my team that we minimize the artificial components in a model. Uh, so we, we do fill holes, but we try to minimize that hole filling so that we got really only authentic data. Um, as a matter of interest, the field time to processing time is between one to four to one to eight, which means for one week in the field, we can use up to two months of processing. Um, it's, a, a very, it's basically an expensive process to produce these models. Um, now I want to show you some examples of Polnarua and Meridigria. Uh, by the way, the project was we have a, a donor, this, uh, Duncan Saville from the Saville Foundation. He's an Australian, a former UCT student, University of Cape Town student, and he pays the, my team, the three team members. I, I work pro bono. And um, this specific project was funded by Margosa Graphite, who I believe work in Sri Lanka. Um, if you want to get to, to the data, to the Sigiria, Oh, sorry, to the Meridigaria and, and Polnarua data, you can visit our website, which is samaniproject.org. That's what it looks like. 
what you see in there is, by the way, Maroa in Africa. Um, you can then go to, you see here on top, you see sites. Sorry, if you go to sites, you can then go to Paul Narua. And there you can choose between 3D models, panorama tour, general photos, plans and sections, images of the 3D models. Here at the top, these are actual 3D models, which you can rotate, and these are images, and you can choose maps. Um, in the data collection for these two sites, there was um, 680 scans altogether, 150 panoramas we took, and 23,000 photos. So it was a substantial amount of work. We were, I think we were there for 10 days, and we were a group of four. Um, and these are the models, which we, these are not the actual models, these are just screen prints of the models. The actual model you can rotate and move in. Um, you probably recognize them, it's your country, so I'm sure you're familiar with these. Uh, we were very happy with the results. We actually got uh, quite good results for, for your models. And this was one of my favorites, but they're all beautiful, really beautiful. I, I just loved working in your country. Um, one of the problems here, as I pointed out before, is all the material which we have to remove. We haven't done all of it. We removed some of the main ones, but not, not all. Here you see in this one, we moved the, the yellow box there standing there, I think the collection box, but this must still be removed at some stage. But we also generated the author photos. I explained the author photo or the photographic map to you. Um, this is part of the geographic information system. So the, the underlying um, map can then be used to, for augmentation. You can augment it with names. You can put um, other information in there. So the GIS is really central to the management of a site. I'm sure you have it at some sites. Um, you can also produce line drawings on the right-hand side. This is an automated process. It's not run with, with AutoCAD or so. It's an automated process, which allows us to outline the features. Um, an idea of the panoramas, we had 140, 150 panoramas. I will show you one or two of them later. These are the positions where we took the panoramas. Um, now, going away from Sri Lanka, uh, I want to show you some applications. Um, there is, for example, here, this is a site which we documented in Meroe, in, in Sudan. The German Archaeological Institute uh, asked us to, they, they wanted to do a conservation project on the site, and they wanted every single of these stones recorded, and they wanted to measure it accurately. If you take a photo, you cannot measure this accurately. But as you see here on the top right here, they um, added information, attributes to each stone. Each stone was, was measured, and they've got a record because some of this will be dismantled and put together again. So that is one use of, of our data. Uh, there's another application. And we have near Cape Town, there is a dam. Uh, the dam wall has been raised by 10 meters and the rock art, which is at the, at the edge of the dam uh, was flooded. Before they increased the dam wall, we were asked to come and record the site. What is happening now, they will or they have already cut the rock art out. They are creating a model based on our 3D model of the, of the whole rock information that's done in, in plastic or some material. Um, and uh, then the actual rock art pieces, which were cut out, are mounted inside these rocks. Uh, there might be people who don't agree with this approach, but the alternative would be to, to leave the, the rock art being flooded and probably destroyed by, by water. So here we could help. Um, so our model did help to create the, the physical model and then the, the actual rock art was then placed inside that model. Another application is in Great Zimbabwe. The conic tower in Great Zimbabwe is very famous. And on the left is a photo, on the right hand side is the 
actual model which we created, not textual, as you see, it's grayscale. This was done at an early stage of our work where we didn't have the capability to do the texturing. That's more recent. And what we did then, we came back about 10 years later, we scanned again, and we established if there were any deformations in those walls. On the right-hand side, you can see the scale from red to blue. Um, the central area, there, there's, there's no deformation. In the other area, there are very few, there's no red or very little red and very little blue. So it's, the wall has basically suffered very little. Uh, the units here are millimeters, so the, the wall has suffered very little deformation. But it shows you something about the accuracy of laser scanning and of modeling. So one, one can, with this technology, determine what deformations were there. This is a project in Zandibar, not the one of the House of Wonders, which I will talk about a bit later. But this is the, the, the Palace Museum, uh, the former palace of the Sultan of Zandibar, which was turned into a museum. You see it's in a pretty bad state, like a lot of Zandibar is in, in very bad condition uh, because of decay. Uh, the, the weather conditions are pretty harsh there. This is about 150 years old. This is 150 now, more, more like 120 years old. And we worked for the World Monument Fund. And what you see here, here is their, uh, product, their record. We didn't produce this sheet. This sheet was produced by the World Monument Fund. They added information on there, and they used our models. Uh, what you see at the bottom left, this is our model. And right is also our model. This was textured already. So they, they used it extensively. And we worked with the World Monument Fund a couple of times. They used it extensively for their conservation. Well, maybe extensively is a bit exaggerated. They use it for their, uh, their um, conservation projects. Uh, another application is this cave in South Africa. Um, our data were used for research. They, they published a number of papers on this cave. It's supposedly the place with the oldest ever used um, fire made by humans. And uh, they have evidence, they believe they have evidence, it's about 300,000 years, 300, years ago. And they, in these publications, they use our data for measurements for uh, the rate, latest use was for the wind study. They wanted to find out if the ash which they found in the cave could have been brought in uh, by wind as opposed to uh, by fires made by humans. Uh, you can see from the scale, it's quite a long area. It's over 100 meters. And they also used it, our model, to construct a walkway. There's a walkway because they were worried about the archaeology being affected or destroyed by visitors. So they have a walkway, a wooden walkway, and that was designed on the basis of our data. Now I come to the collapse of the House of Wonders, a partial collapse on the 25th of January. Um, this beautiful building was built in 1883 uh, by the Sultan of Zanzibar. It's called the House of Wonders because it's got the first lift in, in Africa, or in East Africa rather, and it's also got electricity, but it's very unusual. The, the Sultan wanted to show that Zandibar could also be modern and not backwards as it was perceived overseas. And this is what happened on the 25th of December. The building collapsed, or well, not the building, the front right corner of the building collapsed. And then I got a call. The reason for it is not sure yet. Uh, our survey will hopefully contribute to the understanding of, of this event. Um, I got a call a couple of days later from UNESCO and they asked me if I could document it because we had, very fortunately, we had documented this building in 2019. Here it is. Um, that, so that is the original shape using our technology. Um, this is 6.2 billion triangles created from 9,000 photos and 600 scans, uh, which make up this building. It's inside and outside. Um, what is frustrating for, for us is that we can only show what you're seeing there is only 10 million triangles of the 6.2 billion. So in other words, only 0.2% of the 
of the data which we collected and which we have can be displayed. You need an extremely fast computer, a very powerful computer to show the, the full data volume. But what we can do, we can take small sections of the big model and there use the full resolution to just look at these small sections for detail. Um, that's just as a matter of interest. Um, we, this is a cut through the building, a section through the building, just to show that we are documenting the inside as well. Um, and the idea was to use this for conservation in interventions in 2019. Uh, now this, is, this tower is no longer there and the front section is no longer there. But this is the 2019 model. It was also meant that it, has, it is being used for augmented reality in TV documentary, in a TV documentary. There's a TV documentary being produced about the trade between Oman and East Africa. And in this documentary, they are reenacting scenes. They're using our model to put in their artificial creatures, like the Sultan appears there and the court is there. And so they're using the model to create this. And it really looks very, it looks real. If, if you see it, it looks real. This is our latest model, the one we created. We only finished it last week. In fact, the texture, the texture version is only finished today. I didn't have a chance to, to include this in the presentation. So this is just the, the grayscale value. And this will be used now to establish what happened on the building, in the building and, uh, and maybe even find the reason for the collapse. What we did there, we created these sections at the intervals which you can see on the right-hand side. And then we used, so, horizontal sections through the building. And this is one of those. And what I did there, I used my experience in deformation analysis. I'm basically a, a precise engineering uh, engineer, surveyor. And um, we, we measured lots of points, coordinates. And I measured on, on every, uh, on the 2019 model and on 2021 model, and then I did an analysis of the distances to establish if the distance had changed and if they had changed by how much and what, what they why they possibly would have changed. Um, so that was then the part of the analysis. And I'm not at this stage allowed to reveal the result of my um, survey there of our analysis because uh, there were fatalities, four people died during the collapse and there might be court cases and that's why I've been asked not to say anything about the results, but I can explain the message. What we also did, we compared the two point clouds. Um, in other words, the surface is the millions of points on surfaces. This is one wall. And you can see there, um, again, a color scale on the right-hand side. The yellow areas indicates a leaning forward. So the, these, what you're seeing, there are two models, two models superimposed, two point clouds superimposed of one specific wall. And you can see from there, in the top right-hand corner, the 2021 wall is leaning slightly forward. This is obviously very relevant because we now have to, have to secure this wall uh, to make sure that it doesn't further collapse. Uh, the rehabilitation is being discussed at the moment and there will be measures taken to rehabilitate the building and, and reconstruct something. Um, what I also did, I looked at, the, on the right-hand side, you see the pillars. And um, these pillars, uh, I again used the sections which I showed you before, and it was a very trivial exercise. If the top section, so two sections for each pillar, pillar, the pillars are about seven meters high. And uh, if the two coincide, then the pillar is not leaning. If they're not coincide, then they are obviously the pillars leaning. And this was the result of this analysis. These are the pillars leaning in different direction and the structure engineers will now analyze this further and uh, see what they can derive from that. What we also did, we just superimposed the two sections through the buildings to the 2019 model and the 2021 model. We superimposed those and we compared them just visually. And you can see there uh, how accurate the laser scans are. Where the building hasn't changed, there is a full agreement between the red and the blue lines 
uh, where the these are the two different periods. What you can also do on laser scans is just uh, as an example here, you can do very precise measurements of wall thicknesses, and that obviously is is interesting in uh, in the reconstruction of the building. It doesn't say much about the deformations, but it says something about what has to be reconstructed because we have the 2019 model and every single feature of the, the structure can be measured in this form. Um, we also use GPS points because I, I'm a bit, I mean, this is my personal view and please don't quote me on this one. I think there might be a problem in this area and there might be a possible settlement. Um, that's between the building and the sea. That's only about 50 meters or so, or a bit more, maybe 80 meters. So in this area, there could be a, a settlement. And I've placed all these, or we have placed all these GPS points in here. Um, and we want to go back, provided uh, we get funding from, from UNESCO, uh, and repeatedly measure these points to establish if there is stability. Uh, what we also try to do, and I'm still waiting for permission from in UNESCO to do this is I want four points on the building for permanent monitoring. Um, there are is now equipment, GPS equipment, which can be mounted on top of the roof, equipped with an alarm system, and uh, the moment the building moves, well, not the moment, it takes a bit of a, of a delay, but uh, these points is that if we get permission to do this, it will be connected to University of Cape Town, to university in Germany, uh, which the Boyd University, which supplies the equipment, and to the authorities in Zanzibar. And the moment any changes occur, with a brief delay, as I said, there will be alarm triggered and uh, people will be warned about possible further collapses. Um, now, if you allow me to briefly talk about issues in heritage documentation. Um, permits is a, a major difficulty for us. To work on a site, you need a permit, as you well know. And getting those permits is not easy. There's always a suspicion people, we, we are working entirely pro bono. We just need our costs recovered. People wonder, why do we do this? There, there's a suspicion that we might actually make money out of this, or that we whatever, I don't know, make computer games or whatever. So there's always suspicion. I always have to convince people. It's a bit frustrating. I come to a country, I offer something for free, something which is quite expensive. I offer it for free, I offer expertise for free, and I have to go on my knees and beg, can I please do this? And that is a bit frustrating. Then we need permission to import equipment temporarily. Uh, when you come with a laser scanner to the airport, arrive at customs, there's always a question, why laser? What are you doing with laser? And the worst difficulty is getting a permit to fly a drone. There are some countries like Egypt where drone flying by anybody, but a, one specific company is not allowed. Uh, we have a project in, in Egypt by the end of the year, hopefully, and if it requires a drone. I'm struggling to get a permit. And that is not unique for Egypt, but especially bad in that case. Funding is a problem. Uh, we are not for profit, as I said. We have no budget. Um, we had from the Mellon Grant, I, I started the project 14 years ago with a Mellon Grant, Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, which allowed me to uh, hire people for, for about six years, yes, and then we ran out of money. And then fortunately, a, a UCT alumni, Duncan Seville, um, that agreed to pay the salary of my team, three team members. But we have no money for running, running costs, for equipment, anything like this. This has to be begged. I call myself the Oliver Twist of heritage documentation because I'm forever begging for, for money and it's not for myself. Um, so the salaries are sponsored. Um, and what we have to do, sorry, for each si side, I have to uh, find somebody who sponsors the side. In this case, Sri Lanka, it was Magosa Miles and the Seville Foundation, the Seville Foundation. Uh, in other cases, it's universities, 
uh, who have a research project on the site and they want our data, it can be uh, the World Monument Fund, uh, the Getty Conservation Institute, have worked, UNESCO has uh, supported our projects. And that is one of a real difficulty and I have sleepless nights trying to keep the project going. We've managed for 14 years. I hope it will continue like this. Um, then another real nightmare is rights to the data. Who should have access to the data? Um, if you look at the people who can claim access, there are national agencies like the Petra National Park or the Ghana Monuments and Museums Board or Museums and Monuments Board. They say, if you scan there, the data are theirs. The Orthodox Church in Ethiopia, when we do the Church of Laribela, the church says the data are ours. Um, in case of, of a mosque survey, like in Jenne, we surveyed the, the great mosque of Jenne, the Iman required the data. Also, he probably couldn't do anything with the data, but he felt, and I understand this right. Um, then we, what about the money team and myself? Do I have rights to the data? Uh, then there are cultural ethnic groups like the Khoisan, the uh, the original inhabitants of South Africa, they have a right to the cave, to rock art, which we document. It's, it's their, their heritage, and they should have a right. Um, then typically Department or Ministry of Tourism, Department, oh, sorry, that's a mistake. That was meant to be of, that's correct, tourism and, and culture. Um, they all feel, I personally, and that's my personal view, is I, feel the country has first right to it. But not everybody agrees with me. I suspect that ICAMAS would not agree with this or, or UNESCO. But um, it, it's, it's, that's my personal view. And, um, but I, I do give the data to other people. But I get, I wouldn't say weekly, but every other week, or maybe weekly, I get a, a mail, an email from somebody who asks for a model. Our models are very popular. And what, what <laughs> And I know that many, in many cases, people wanted to make money. They want to create rupi, uh, replicas and sell it. They want to create computer games. That's my biggest concern. And I don't want, a, say, a Buddhist site to be used in a computer game to chase some criminals through the site. Because the sites are, are beautiful and they, they, they are ideal for uh, sort of a computer game. And it really concerns me. Or just imagine somebody chasing Al Qaeda through a, through a mosque. And that is really serious concern for me. There are other groups who have a right to the Mellon Foundation because they gave us the data, the Seville Foundation, University of Cape Town, because we are linked to the University of Cape Town. I've got my office there, the World Monument Fund. The, then the universities I work for, the Rice University, Aga Khan, all these claim. I mean, it's, it's, it's never really an argument. It's, it's, it's just, it's a difficulty. And it's difficult for me to sort out. Basically, that's my situation. That's what I feel like. Um, if I may, you know, may now show you some examples of our collection. Um, this is the Great Mosque of Jenner. Uh, we have done 275. It's a bit more than 275 structures on more than 65 sites in 18 countries. We've got 100 terabyte of data. That's a huge collection. And um, you can see this area is, is empty because it's politically not easy to get there. It's very dangerous to work there. So we, uh, we have worked a lot on the East Coast of Africa. We work on the West Coast. A bit in, in North Africa, we're going to Morocco probably uh, in July. Uh, Petra is one of our major sites. <coughs> Excuse me. To give, show you examples, this is um, in Tanzania. <clears throat> the Guresa in the Portuguese structure, originally Portuguese and then um, added to by the um, Omani Arabs. And um, that's a model of the Guresa. It's one of my favorite sites. It's not much tourism there, very few tourists, in fact. And it's still very original in many ways. That's the beautiful inside of the mosque of Kilwa. And this is our model of the outside. You can go in. This was at the early stages where we didn't texture. I want to go back and, and do some texturing there. Um, another view of the mosque. Songomara. It's a bit like Africa's uh, Angkor Wat. <laughs> Not in, in the 
quality and, and the beauty of the sites, but in the, the fact that it is very much overgrown and uh, vegetation is sort of taken over there and uh, one, one needs to do something to preserve it and also to record it. Uh, this is our model of uh, the site, the Sultan's Palace, and we documented it completely. Um, some of the difficulties in working there, we had to, uh, what you see there in the background, this is where we had to go. It took about 45 minutes every day, walking through the, wading through this water on, on coral surfaces, carrying equipment without being able to rest for one moment or put down the equipment on, on the ground because there was only water. And we did this for about 10 days every day. But it's still, it's, it's still exciting and fun in spite of the difficulty. Timbuktu, uh, I somehow have a special liking for this part of the mosque. I don't know why I can't explain it, but it's got a special beauty for me. It's the Jingere Bear Mosque in Timbuktu. Uh, that's the model. This side is a Sudanese style. The rest is uh, the uh, North African style of the mosque. Um, one of the elevations. In Ghana, um, another problem which I have is that I want a collection of African heritage. That was my objective. But a lot of the Af African heritage, unfortunately, does not exist anymore because it was built from mud and from the wood. And that doesn't last hundreds of years. So there are very few real African sites we have. There are um, dry stone structures and there are shrines like these, but they're unfortunately not that many. And, and uh, it's, it worries me that I don't have, the, many of the sites are colonial, like the, the, we have got the slave cartons of Ghana, which are colonial basically. And even the Omani sites in East Africa could be considered as colonial. But this is, I'm trading on dangerous ground, so I'd rather not discuss it at length. Um, this is a Nashanti shrine in Ghana. Uh, we created this model of it, as the sections of the shrine. In Sudan, the beautiful site in Meroe, there are, no, I can't remember, I think about 40 pyramids. Some are renewed, restored, somewhat questionable maybe. Um, this is our model of one. They are different to the Egyptian pyramids. The um, so-called black pharaohs of Meroe buried their dead underneath the pyramid, as opposed to the Egyptian, which, as you know, uh, have their tombs inside the pyramid. Another view is an orthogonal projection. Um, so it's basically an, an also image, but not of the ground, but of the side of the pyramids, an elevation. Again, you can measure. Um, we uh, scanned the whole area, that's the North Cemetery. And uh, we've got, uh, there are two more cemeteries, uh, which we partly did. We did one, the other ones we only did partly. That's all that, but you're seeing there's laser scans. That's myself doing, it was easier to get up there than getting down, but <laughs> I managed, I survived. Um, <clears throat> the value of the Queens in Egypt was on a project which we did for the Getty Conservation Institute. Um, here you see myself in my Indiana Jones impersonation. Um, what we did in this case, we didn't do a building, we did a flood risk assessment. Um, I'm giving showing these examples because you might have applications in Sri Lanka of a similar nature, but it wouldn't look like this, of course, but in principle. Um, this is the valley. We created, we laser scanned the whole, whole valley. Uh, we couldn't do it from the air because there was a restriction on flying drones, and we also couldn't see everything from the air. Uh, this is a contour map, um, then we draped the satellite image over it, and we did plotline analysis. So we established the flood lines. The reason was the Getty Conservation Institute wanted to know where the, the flood water would come down. It doesn't rain very often there, but if it rains, then it's bad because the ground is dry and it doesn't sink in. And there, there are serious floods and there are important tombs like the tomb of Nefertari is there. And they want to know the way the water is running. These are the catchment areas and the bottom of each of these shapes shows where the water comes together. We combined our scan with a maps produced by some Egyptian, sorry, by a US archaeologist, Kent was his name. 
we combined the data. He surveyed the tombs. We didn't survey the tombs. He did that. We surveyed two or three. And um, then we created this here, which allows uh, to look at the relative position of the tombs. And in some cases, the passages were more closer together than it was uh, that people thought it was. <coughs> Sorry. Myanmar, another site. I consider myself extremely privileged being able to see all these wonderful sites and work there and do a little bit, make a small contribution to their survival. Uh, Bagan was one of the special ones. Um, there are, you probably know in Bagan, there are 3,600, I think, over 3,000 temples and, and pagodas in, in a small area. Um, this is one which collapsed as a result of an earthquake. And we surveyed this one. Uh, there were difficulties because of the bamboo scaffolding which covered the surface of the building. Uh, it was very difficult to set up the scanner there. Uh, there were a lot of um, worshippers and also some tourists who obviously were in the way of our scans and obviously we couldn't ask them to leave. Um, then it was difficult to work there. As you can see, it was quite dangerous. It, the terrain was fragile and we had to cl climb over this. Um, very precarious instrument setups. This is 40 meters above the ground. And this instruments cost a million rand. And then the problem which we also had in uh, Mary de Greer, uh, we had to walk all day without shoes on extremely hot stones, um, which we were not used to. We took buckets with water to be able to survive. And that is the point cloud. There's an artificial sky behind it, artificial vegetation. The point cloud of a building of two of the temples. This is our model, and there's another version of it. Um, another form of showing the data, which is a bit maybe over the top, I'm not sure if that's justifiable from a scientific perspective, but it looks nice. And something different, which I would, uh, I don't know if you've got an application of a similar nature, I'm not talking about slave trade, but about a phenomenon, historic phenomenon, which can be put into a story. Um, we documented the, there are about 32 castles along the uh, coast of uh, East Africa, uh, West Africa, especially Ghana. And uh, we worked on one of, uh, on, on six of them, um, and we created a database. Um, it's called the story map. This is a technology which is introduced by ESRI. ESRI produced the famous ArcGIS system. And that allows us to tell a story via spatial data. You can then, we, I can't do this here, but we can click on these various things and you can then get information. Um, we used data which were created by the University, Emory University in America. They collected information on, um, I think it was 38,000 um, trips. Um, well, trips on several of this context. Uh, transports of slaves from Africa to America. And we put those, that information into a, a database and a GIS. You can now ask how many or which voyages took place from Accra to America. Where did they go to? How many slaves were on these? Um, this is the complete collection of, I mean, it's terrible to look at this. If you think that every single of this line represented the fate of hundreds of, of, of people. Um, and anyway, this was the previous one. So you can go in both directions. You can also say, like in, in Rio, how many uh, ships came to Rio? Who was the captain? How many slaves were on the ships? How many survived? And, and the, it, it's, a, it's a very, but I, I cannot claim um, that we produced the, we collected the data. The data, collect, data was collected by the uh, Emory University. We just had the, um, 3D data, we had the, the castles, we made models of six castles, and we created this uh, GIS. Other information, and you can ask questions. Specific. Um, what I found personally uh, was entirely new to me that most of the slaves actually went to Brazil. Oh, I always thought they would go to the Caribbean, but they actually went to Brazil. 
And, and this is something, I, I don't know if you've got similar applications in, in Sri Lanka, as I said, not slave trade, but any other historical events which have a sort of a flow in it, and it's a very nice way to do this. And that's one of the castles, Elmina Castle, and this is our model of the castle. That's the team um, in, in Maroon. This is our web page. I've got a little bit more to tell you, I think. No, I think that's all. I can then show you some a video which we created. You might find this interesting. So what you're seeing there, what you will see, is a the video of our model. The surrounding area is artificial. It's a game environment. It is questionable. I don't know if it's a good thing to do this, but my team loves it. You know, it's, it's they, they take our model and put it into this game environment. And so the trees are artificial, and but the model is correct. So all this is model. It's not a video like a normal. No, we can't see it yet. <clears throat> yeah, we cannot see the video. You cannot see the video? No. Yes, yeah. Please um, replay but from the beginning. That is very sad. What can we do? No, I can see it on my screen. From the think, PowerPoint, no? Yeah. Pardon? I think uh, remove the first sharing. That uh, sharing uh, PowerPoint, I think better to remove that first. And uh, well, I can uh, stop the PowerPoint, yes. We can still, uh, we, we will, st yeah. Well, I finished with the PowerPoint, so I can leave that. Um, okay, 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 okay. All right. I don't know if you should try again, just very briefly, if it works. It's a, it's a pity. Yeah, please. Can you see? It doesn't uh, work. And you uh, see, now okay. I stopped the whole, Still not. Still not. Ah, yes, coming. Yeah, it's coming. Ah, yes, yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah. Now oh, it's yeah. okay. Can you see it now? All right. Uh, allow me to start again. Um, okay. Can you see it? Yes. Yes. Oh, good. And in the real model, you can, I mean, what we did here, we just walked through the model and made a video of it, but you can go anywhere in this model where you wish to. I mean, this is a wonderful way to see the side, I think. Okay, I won't show the whole thing. You can find, if, if you want the video, Please let me know. I will send it to you. Just please. Um, now, screen sharing has stopped. I would now want to briefly go. Two more things I want to show you. Um, this yes, is. Okay. Can you see this? Thank you. Probably not. Hmm? The screen sharing seems to have stopped. Uh, not yet. Can you see it now? Is it visible? Yeah, it's visible. Okay. Yeah, visible, so visible. Yeah. What I want to demonstrate here is that this model is from our web page. If you go to our web page and you look for Paul Marua, you will find this model. And you can maneuver it, you can measure it, you can see it from underneath and from top. So that is a capability which we have. And now there's a new problem. I want to show you, the, at last, I want to show you a panorama tour. Let me see if that works. Um, 
I, I can't get there. Right here. Can you see this? Probably not. Hmm? Yeah, it's, yeah, you can see. It. Can you see? Can you see it? Yeah. This is one of the least scientific of our products, but one of the most popular ones. Um, what you see on the top right, uh, can you see what I'm showing you? Can you see the, the map on the top right? Yes, yes, yes we can. Okay. Yes. So these blue spots here are places where we took panorama. So you can go to this. If you click on it, there we are. And you see this little blue, like a fan, that shows which way, in which direction you're looking as I rotate. So wait, sorry. As I rotate, it will change. You see the fan here changes. And in this way, you can visit the site. This is ideal for a tourist center. You can people, especially people like the, the, a family might come, one family member might be older or handicapped in any way. They might not be able to go to the site. They can at least see some of it. And um, so you can go from point to point. We've got 150 of these panoramas covering the whole of uh, Meridigeria and Polnarua. So that is also available. And I think I've shown you now everything I wanted to show you. I'm available for questions. Anything anybody would like to, to hear or know? Uh, it is very nice. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, uh, I'm here. Added remarks, you know, you want to be uh, authentic to the place and the culture. But I want to ask whether you could, as a separate exercise or as a parallel exercise, uh, clothe these buildings conjecturally with cladding, with roof, and so on. Is it possible? It may not to be. Move it I, I understood that you said I tried to be authentic, which is correct. No, no, that is correct, yeah. But as an added exercise hmm, to try and illustrate how it looked, say, a thousand years ago, thereabouts, that is, have the roof, have the walls, it, it's conjecture. Yeah, I, I personally don't do that because I feel I'm not qualified to do it. No, no, I, uh, all that... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you get... <laughs> Some people from Sri Lanka who would know about the descriptions and do it. Yes. Could be done, yeah. yeah. Could be done. But it's, as I said, I stay away from it. Because no, no, I, I understand it. that. It, uh, color it could be done. Can be done, yeah. I'm often asked this question and uh, I've always had to say no, but it certainly can be done. And uh, we, if you could join forces, that's a possibility to do something quite exciting there. Because Does that answer your question? Similar ones had been done for Anuradhapura, where conjecturally some buildings had been reconstructed. Yeah, but I can reconstruct. I mean, you could use our laser scan data to reconstruct the building because all the measurements are there. Yeah. yeah. You know, but of course, only the existing part, the rest is conjecture. But this is the most accurate way of doing a reconstruction. Yeah. Using I mean, laser scan on the basis. Yeah. Uh, in some of this Sri Lankan stuff, there are descriptions, you know, in the chronicles and so on. So one could use that as a guide. Would be ideal, yeah. I'd, I'd love to do something like this. But as I told you repeatedly now, I don't feel qualified and I need somebody like with your knowledge or with your colleague's knowledge to do something like this. Yes, Dr. Guru, like, that's an interesting idea. I think that's uh, that may be maybe we can do it the archaeological department or the central cultural fund should uh, think about the next project or the second step of this same project or the extension of this project to try doing at least one or two selected um, selected uh, monuments to do conjectural reconstructions based on uh, professor arud's uh, uh, outcomes but i'm do certainly available for this our data are available for it, and we can also help with it. Yes, yes, that's great. Any more questions for Professor Ruth? 
um, I have a question, if I may. Yes, please. Please go ahead. Oh, um, hi, Professor Zarut. Uh, it's um, I'm Ruan. I'm joining from UK, actually. Uh, I'm so very impressed about your work, and especially you are doing it for free. Uh, my question to you is, if you uh, input this data into a 3D um, a scanner or something, would you, will you be able to get a, a, a proper 3D model, not a pitch model, but actual model? Oh, yes, yeah. Of... No, we can do that, yeah. No problem. We've done so, that. Right. So my question okay. is, yeah. uh, I don't know about the ethics of it, but say, for example, you're really struggling with funding. Uh, uh, if you make small models, and then, you know, um, at least to fund your project, if, if, if it can be sold, uh, you know, with permission from those people as well, would it be uh, some way of at least recovering your costs, which is involved? Um, it's, I mean, I, I must confess that thought occurred to me as well, obviously. And um, it, it's complicated because, uh, for example, we worked in Petra, we've done extensive work in Petra. Uh, and I, I spoke to people there and, and they said, no, that cannot be done because it's, it's the property of the Petra Archaeological Park, and which is understandable. I mean, it's, it's something they feel it's their right to use this data, but it could be, it could be, we, we could use it. Um, there's something else which I forgot to mention, by the way, and that is a virtual reality. Uh, we have, our, our models can be turned into virtual reality, into caves as well. You can, otherwise, if you put oculus, um, the oculus glasses, these 3D glasses on, you can actually immerse yourself in that environment. And it, it's absolutely spectacular. I, I nearly fell off a chair because I maneuvered through one of these models and I, I thought with my shoulder, I was hitting a wall and, and, and I evaded this. It was so real that I had to actually struggle to stay on the chair. I'm not exaggerating this. So that would be another way possibly to, to make money, to have, a, have something at a visitor center if you pay, but it's, it's, I don't know, it's difficult. You see, somehow I, I do it for free because I love it. And um, it, it's, it's something I, I get so much pleasure out of doing is that I, I feel the doing this somewhat questionable thing of making money out of it somewhat feels wrong. I don't know, I, I can't explain it, I, but it feels wrong. I, 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 I agree with for, uh, what you're saying, but you have to, uh, I mean, this is a wonderful project you're doing for free. And I know that, you know, some, at some stage you will run out of the money. There should be a continuous stream. But anyway, uh, 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 just one other question. But thanks for the thought. Uh, and thanks for the sympathy. <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much. Um, uh, in, in Europe, have you got any contacts, uh, especially I'm, I'm from UK. Have you got any contacts? Or is this a, a particular project only done by University of Cape Town, <clears throat> or is this uh, the technology which is shared between other countries as well? Um, well, I, I, I try to share it with countries I'm working in, but as I'm working largely in uh, countries which are less developed, uh, the technology is very often not there. And it, it doesn't apply for Sri Lanka, obviously, but it certainly applies for South African countries. And if we're sharing it's less of a technical sharing. It's more of a, you know, I, I'm working in conjunction with archaeology departments as opposed to other groups which do the same work as, as we do. There are two American groups who want to work with us, but we haven't come to a real agreement. That's SIARC and uh, Global Heritage Fund. Um, and they want to work with us, but we, we're still working on a possibility of realizing this. But in the UK, we've got nothing. And there is the, I used to be, on the Council of the International Society for Photogrammetry. And we had links to UK, uh, or what they called the, the British, <laughs> I can't remember, the name. So, some heritage group in, the, in Britain. Uh, but that's sort of, when I left council, that someone disappeared. But um, it, you are, you're quite right when you're suggesting that we should have more context. But Cape Town is very isolated. We're sitting at the southern tip of Africa. Not at the southernmost, but at the southern tip. Thank you very much. Thank you. Those who have thanks questions for the thought. may also uh, type to uh, the chat box. Uh, then we can moderate that uh, for Professor Ruth. Uh, or otherwise, you can um, ask your question straight away. 
uh, for 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 the information of the truth uh, i would like to tell you that we uh, have we tried we did one started one uh, 3d documentation project at sigiria in collaboration with the bamberg university in germany um, mr max Rekri. which which university which one uh, bamberg university in germany bamberg okay, okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but this is quite a while ago, not so? Yeah, uh, have you heard about that? Yes, I heard about it. Yeah. Yes, we did it in a uh, year before you came, that was in 2018. And we did only right, the yeah. first season of work, and the second season was uh, interrupted due to the COVID situation. But yeah. uh, we are once the COVID situation is, uh, is uh, become comes under control, then we will do the second uh, season as well and to complete the CIGDIA project. And, we discussed about creating a, a virtual, uh, uh, it's a kind of a 3D replica of Sigiria Fresco because there are so many people who cannot climb the spiral staircase. That's right, Jan. Yeah, that's an interesting project and uh, we were looking forward to have the second season. But we if we can contribute it, uh, I'm happy to contribute if, if that's, oh, that's That's desirable. great, yeah, that's great. Yeah. And the Archaeological Department, Central Cultural Fund, and the University of Kalini mm -hmm. and the Bamberg University did it in collaboration. No, I, I'm, I'm certainly, I would be happy to do that. Okay, we have one question from um, uh, Dr. Kavan Ranatunga. Yes, Kavan. Kavan. Dr. Kavan Ranatunga. I think it's muted. It's muted. Yeah, um, uh, Mr. Jatis. Okay, hello. Uh, okay. What, I, I, what I wanted to ask you was you said in a few places that you get two to three centimeter resolution, and in another place you said talked about five to ten centimeter resolution. Now, that would be sufficient for most large scale structures, but if you go into looking at the individual sculptures, then I presume two to three centimeters will blur it out. Is there any way you could have a changing resolution so that oh, yes. sculptures at a higher resolution so that you can look at them as what you would normally expect to see? You are quite right. Uh, and we do this. We have done, for example, we've done the statue of Nelson Mandela in very high resolution. We've done some rock art, not rock art, some stone tools in high resolution. But you see, we can't do it for the building because the data volume would be absolutely I mean, astronomical. You've seen House of Wonder, we have six, mil six billion points with that resolution, with two centimeters. If you would go to high resolution, it would be as a completely unmanageable for any computer. No, so, but uh, what I'm saying it can is, be done. But what I'm saying is not for the whole structure, but to uh, isolate certain small regions which have sculptures or something, and for those little regions, go into higher resolution so that you have a changing resolution in your model so that it's not all what is appropriate for the large scale building, but you have a higher resolution whenever you get to the small regions which have sculptures. Can be done. And we've done it for one of the, in Polnarua we did it. For okay. I think a moonstone, just as an experiment. It, it can be done, but it means a lot of extra work and it means more time on site and it means a more a larger model. Even if it's only small section, it still increases the model, but it can be done, yes. So is that, done it, is that included in the uh, your model that we can access uh, to a website? Yes, you can. If you go to zamaniproject.org, right. zamaniproject.org, okay. and uh, I think I, I had this, I don't want to, cut you off now by going back into the PowerPoint presentation, but... That's fine, but I will look at it. I think we can share the link, I guess. You go to yeah. zamaniproject.org, then you go to sites, you okay. scroll down, you find Sri Lanka, and okay. then you go to models. It's not okay. a high resolution model, it's a low resolution model, but certainly you can use... What, when I showed you the model, when, when I rotated the model and navigated the model, I actually did go to the web page. I've been to our web page. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Carmen, for your question. Uh, Ashley, um, you are on the chat box. Ashley wants to thank Professor Rudan and uh, 
Ashley says it is unfortunate that we cannot meet as we have worked on reconstruction of the Jetavana monastery complex in Anuradhapur. Ashley, would you like to uh, talk to uh, Professor Rudan? Ashley, are you there? Yeah, just a moment. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. we do. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, it's unfortunate, Professor, that we cannot meet, but when you are here next time, we can show you what we did on a complete sort of animation of a day in the life of the Jayatavana Monastery. Uh, I'd love to see that, you know. Our film, uh, totally animated from measurements that we did at site and conjectures and so on. And uh, everybody who saw it uh, feels that it is very accurate. So it's something that we can share at some time. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Thank it was you. a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, we also have Johan uh, Ferreira on the chat box. Uh, Johan, you want to talk or you want me to read your message? Johan says, Professor Rudha, um, you're fantastic. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah. I work on the House of Wonders in Zanzibar was featured on BBC's The Travel Show just yesterday. Thank you very much for fantastic presentation. Much appreciated. Johan, do you want to add? Are you there, Johan? Thank you for pointing it out, by the way. I, I, I knew about it, but I don't like seeing myself on TV. So <laughs> I didn't watch it. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I, I heard about it and... Uh, I'm it glad that somebody fantastic. saw it. It was just fantastic yesterday. And I, I knew that you were coming on today. And uh, it, it was really, I think they're doing some really good work there. And it was a very short, uh, short clip. Uh, hopefully, they'll have more details on social media. Uh, but for the program, mm -hmm. because the program is very short, uh, I think it was only about two or three minutes. But it, it was yeah, really... They interview, interviewed me for half an hour, but they only took about 10 seconds out of it. Or exactly. It was a very short clip. But thank you so much. And thank you so much for what you have done here in Sri Lanka as well. And it's a fascinating project. Um, I, I used to watch a program on, I think, Nagio called... Uh, uh, where they used um, um, these um, scanners... Uh, at sites around the world and create, you know, uh, data points. And uh, it's it's just amazing uh, the work that, you know, uh, what they produce, um, really fantastic. So thank you so much for all your hard work. Really, really appreciate it. As I said, it's an honor to be able to work on your sites. It really thank is. you, Yohan, just saying for, this for like. you know, your questions. Do we have any more questions? Uh, I do not see anything on the chat box. Uh, Nanda Deva, may I raise a question? Yes, please, 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 Kai. Please uh, identify yourself also. Professor Ruta, I was very uh, impressed with your presentation. And has raised his And uh, particularly uh, about uh, the accuracy with which you can measure these uh, 3D uh, uh, images that you create. Now, I, I was wondering about whether you had any experience of uh, measuring what happens or, or recording what happens in a buried site, you know, uh, so that you have to use uh, maybe GPR or some other instrument and be able to um, find out what is there and how uh, it's uh, three-dimensionally related to each other within, the, within a buried site uh, could be also a stupor. Uh, may I? So we've done this. I'm not, not myself. I'm not a, a GPR person, but we work together with, with GPR and uh, electromagnetometry in Kilwa in Tanzania. And we combined our model with the data of the, the GPR survey. So we have a, a model there from above ground and underground combined, but the underground data are not uh, the same accuracy as the above ground data. That cannot be achieved yet. One day it will come, but it's not the same accuracy. We can't get to centimeter accuracy underground, at least not the equipment which they used in Kilwa. Right. But in okay. principle, we can combine those. Right. And uh, what forward. is the technology that you use for that sort of thing? The GPR or? Um, that was GPR, yeah. It was Can't a group from GPR. America who had the GPR 
uh, and um, electromagnetometry, I think, was also, but mainly GPR. Fine. Thank but you I'm very much. Okay. Yeah, thank thanks, Lachi, and thanks, Professor Ruth. Um, and now I see Dr. Nilan Kure wants to uh, ask a question. And Nilan, please, uh, floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, so thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Heinz Ruther. Uh, it's a wonderful presentation. Um, uh, thank you again. Um, now, uh, actually, I have seen you. I have visited your website, and um, particularly uh, the, 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 your documentation of uh, the Satmahal Prasad. So the, the, uh, that is, uh, I mean, wonderful. Uh, you can rotate the, the total image, and uh, you, I mean, you can understand and study the real deterioration process of that particular monument uh, as a conservator, architect conservator. I mean, uh, without even visiting the site. I can, uh, you know, prepare a conservation proposal. I mean, th that was the, the type of accuracy you have in your documentation. So, I mean, um, so thank you very much. But I have uh, two questions. One is, uh, you mentioned in your uh, presentation at the very beginning that uh, you are also doing capacity building and training the, the, the local people. Uh, so uh, whether you did something like that in Sri Lanka. And then my second question is, uh, whether you would like to come back to Sri Lanka and work with uh, uh, us and particularly the Como Sri Lanka and of course the Department of Archaeology and the Central Cultural Fund and uh, to, you know, to improve on this type of documentation and also to train our people, our, especially the younger, the professionals in, you know, this type of documentation uh, because, because this is very, very important uh, in the heritage uh, uh, preserve, uh, preservation and not also the heritage interpretation. Uh, yeah, so those are my two so, questions. Uh, to both your you. questions. The first one, um, we typically um, take students or younger uh, researchers or also people from the, you know, from the departments of archa um, anthropology, sorry, archaeology or so on, with us on site, two or three at a time and take accompany us and we show them what we do and we teach equipment. We also give courses. We give a course, a five-day course in heritage documentation, in spatial heritage documentation. And we've done this in about seven or eight countries. And I offered this as well in Sri Lanka and unfortunately it was not taken up. I don't know why I've offered it repeatedly, but there was no interest in it. Also, we didn't have anybody accompanying us on site. We had somebody to help us. There was absolutely no question with this, but I would have liked to see maybe a student or as I said, some junior researcher coming along with us just to see the technology. The second question, I'd be most happy to come back. Um, my, my team would love to come back. We could do more work there. We, we could also give a course if that's of interest. Um, it would, uh, we, we don't charge for what we're doing. It would just, we would require, we don't have funding. We would have required our, our cost to be recovered. That's all. But otherwise, we would definitely be happy to come. I want to do work more. I mean, I, I also was under Rapura and, and, and I loved it. And I told you I was a uh, long time ago, it must have been the 70s, 1978. I, I spent a year in, in Sri Lanka and I visited many of the sites you have. That's a wonderful place and I would like to do more. But um, well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that under Rapura is, is looked and Sidriya are, are recorded. But if we can do any more, we are available. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. Um, and so, so we are so sorry that uh, the capacity building um, program that uh, you intended to do in Sri Lanka didn't go um, as expected. Uh, but uh, maybe in the future, uh, we in the ICOMAS would be able to um, do a better uh, collaborative work if, the, if we get the uh, opportunity. Uh, and thank you, Nilan, for uh, raising that issue. Thank you very much. Uh, do we? I do not see any more questions in the chat box. Um, uh, anyone? Anybody? Um, I have. I have yes. a question, if I may. Please, uh, please, uh, please uh, identify yourself. Uh, once again, it's Ruan. I did ask one question. Okay. Sorry to uh, ask another one. Uh, with my medical background, I'm just wondering. Um, uh, whether your technology can be used on biological um, uh, beings, you know, like say, can you scan a human being? 
and replicate a 3D model of that. Yes, can be done. The, the only condition is that the human being must be must stand still, like uh, in an uh, in a scan, in a normal scan. If one can guarantee that, one can measure that. Yeah. In, in fact, I developed a system years ago uh, for placing patients into a proton beam with cameras. Uh, mm -hmm. We took the data from the MR scan and then we did a 3D system which measured the head of the patient and then the patient was automatically moved in, in, the, in, the, in the beam, into the beam. So it can be done, yeah. And Whole bodies I and also just heads or something. It's safe as well. Thanks for the question, reminding me of my youth. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rana, for asking that question, uh, diverting our attention to another totally uh, different field. Uh, that's really interesting, Professor. Uh, do we have any more questions? Uh, any more questions? Just one comment. You said different field. I even measured elephants with this technique. But oh, that's really? another one. Yeah. <laughs> it, so it, my email address should be available. And if you just look for the money part, if anybody's got questions, please feel free to answer, to ask. Thank you very much for having me. It was a great pleasure to speak to you. And I'm glad to, that there was an interest and that you were so patient. Thank you. Yeah, OK. And I need to uh, thank uh, Dr. Nilan Kure for coordinating uh, this uh, lecture from both ends, from iCommerce end and with coordinating with Professor Ruth. So since there are no more questions, uh, um, I will um, hand over the floor to uh, Sagara. Sagara? Yeah. yeah. Yes, Sagara. We can um, wind up the session. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. Uh... Professor Ainz uh, uh, for the lecture today and also the participant from not only from Sri Lanka and also we saw a couple of uh, uh, friends from uh, overseas also. So then uh, thank you very much. And uh, so hopefully we can meet uh, in, uh, the next uh, lecture. Uh, uh, in the next month. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I'm going to wind up the session. Thank you, Professor uh, Ruth, uh, for joining with us uh, to inspire us on the uh, documentation of heritage. And uh, then uh, for everybody uh, who was on board uh, to listen to Dr. Professor Heinz Truth. Thank you very much. Uh, from ICOMOS Sri Lanka. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you.